Thank you for that song, Brother Tim. That was uh, kind of my theme song, if you will, as I was going throughout the week thinking about the message here. So thank you, Lord. Victory in Jesus. <clears throat> Father, I just give myself to you, and I pray that you would uh, be with my mouth, Lord. I know I have a lot of notes here, but uh, Father, I, I just pray that you would give me a heart the heart of Jesus and the love of Jesus and the compassion of Jesus as I share your word here this morning. I love you, Lord. Amen. So I want to share a message this morning on uh, how to get the victory over the beast. There's a beautiful picture um, of those who get the victory over the beast. In Revelation 15, verse 2, there's a beautiful picture. Those who get the victory over the beast over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name, or in short, if you will, maybe over his identity. Revelation 15, verse 2, And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. <clears throat> and those harps of God, we can be sure, are victory harps, harps of victory. And listen to the song Look at the song that, of victory that they're singing. The next verse. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and mighty, I'm sorry, great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God, the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. And so like as the, the children of Israel who followed Moses out of Egypt in bondage to, to uh, Pharaoh, which is a picture of, of the devil, and, and, and bondage and slavery to Pharaoh and uh, to sin, if you will, um, in the same, and, they, and they went out and they crossed over that Red Sea and they sang the song of victory on the other side. In the same way, we are being called out of Egypt, out of bondage to slavery and slavery to the devil and to sin, and we're being called to follow the, follow the Lamb whithersoever He goes, and we can also sing the song of victory, the song of um, as it says here, the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, we can sing that same long song of victory. Victory in Jesus, as we follow the Lamb, whithersoever He goes, as mentioned in uh, the previous chapter here, verse four, uh, chapter 14 and verse 4. <clears throat> so, in order for us to... Um, have the victory over this evil beast. We, wanna, we need to know what it is that we're up against. Who is he and what is he like? And what does it take to overcome? We want to know what the nature of this beast is so that we can be victorious over him. In the book of Daniel, we see a picture of a ferociously destructive beast with ten horns and he wants to be in absolute control. Nothing above him. He stamps everything down under his feet. And he's very... Uh, destructive. But hallelujah, in that same chapter, we see the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven, and this wicked, controlling, unsubmissive beast is completely destroyed and brought to an end and burned with fire. Now, in, in Revelation here, we see the beast with the seven heads and ten horns pictured quite a number of times. And here in, in chapter 12, if we flip back to chapter 12, we see um, the seven heads and ten horns mentioned and this time it's on what's called a great red dragon. Verse 3 of chapter 12, and there appeared another wonder in heaven and behold a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. And who is that dragon? And in verse 9, if we jump down, it tells us who that dragon is. Verse 9, it says, that great dragon was thrown down that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And what does this remind you of? <clears throat> Genesis 3, that ancient serpent, that subtle beast. Let's, uh, I'll just read that verse, Genesis 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle, more deceptive, if you will, than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Yea, has God said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And of course, Adam and Eve, as we know, gave in to this beast. 
And every child of Adam born ever since has been affected by the nature of this evil, deceptive beast, this serpent called the devil. The very nature that we're born with is motivated by me, myself, and I wanting to do my thing, my way. I want to be in charge of my life. No one will tell me what to do. I will be my own boss. And we see a picture of that in Isaiah uh, chapter 14, verse 12 through 14. How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How are you cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations? For you have said in your heart, and here's five I wills, I will ascend to heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the, on the mount of the congregation of the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. He wants to be in charge. He wants to be in control. He wants to be on top. Not under God's established authority. So you see that nature? Now, can you relate to this nature? Yeah. You know that little thing that rises up in my heart when my boss or my parents or uh, my pastor maybe gives me instruction for my life? And for me, even uh, going through the airport and those in charge, you know, pull me aside and I know there's nothing on me that, they, that they're going to find and they pull me aside and they would pat me down. My wife and children are going on, you know, with the luggage. And I'm thinking, I should be helping them. You know, why are you doing, you know. Why is that thing rising up in my heart? What, what are those unsubmissive feelings that are coming up? And I know it's not right. It's not right. But God did change that in my heart about six years ago. And, uh, but the, the, that thing likes to come back. It's very sneaky. It's very subtle. And I have to walk it out and not allow it to come back, continually submitting myself to the Lord. <clears throat> so now there's two more beasts in uh, Revelation 13 that we want to take a look at. Uh, flip over, if you flip over to Revelation 13 and verse uh, 1 and 2 there. And these two beasts, the power and the nature that they function in is like that of the dragon, the devil who always wants to be in control, refusing to be under God's established authority, and does what he does in order to exalt himself above everything else and everyone else. So verse uh, 1 and 2. I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, and again here, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his head heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, his feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion, and the dragon... That devil gave him his power and his throne and great authority. And I believe back in Revelation 17, uh, verse 12, it would indicate that the horns of this beast are a picture of kingdoms and nations of this world who, of course, are very much like this beast. And as the nations and kingdoms of this world rise up against each other, as Jesus said they would, um, seeking to be on top and in charge, functioning with the nature and the power of this evil beast, this dragon, uh, much destruction happens, as mentioned in verse 16 of chapter 17. Now, I submit to you that the second beast here, um, further down in chapter 13 of Revelation, the second beast, verse 11, is, is the one that will deceive, if it were possible, even the very elect. And perhaps we could call this rising beast, the rising of false Christianity. Jesus said, false Christs and false prophets will rise and show signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the very elect. So this second beast is, is maybe kind of like those mentioned in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, having the appearance of godliness, but denying the power the power of godliness is not there. It's the power of another. It's the power of the dragon. And among other things that are listed there in, in 2 Timothy 3 there, um, it's lovers of their, of their own selves and disobedient to parents. Perhaps we could say disobedient to God-established authority. So what is this beast like? 
let's uh, read it here, verse 11. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, but he spoke as a dragon. And those horns, usually representing position or power or authority, horns like a lamb. It appears like he would be functioning in the power and the authority of a follower of the lamb. The lamb being Jesus, as we know. But when he opens his mouth, who he really is at the core is exposed. He speaks as a dragon. And the very next verse indicates that he functions in the same power of that first beast before him who deceives uh, who, and he, he, who received his power from the dragon, the devil. Uh, verse 12 through 15, I'll just kind of skim down through here. It says, the, uh, he exercises all the power of the first beast before him and he does great wonders and he deceives them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do. And jumping further down, he has power to give life to the image of the beast. So I believe he's a picture of the false prophet, or if you will, the false professing Christian, one who might say, Lord, Lord, but who will not enter the kingdom of heaven because he's actually doing his own will instead of the will of the Father which is in heaven. He functions in the power of the dragon, the devil. And I believe he's in charge of his own life in the midst of his, all his great wonders and deceptive miracles and what appears to be life-giving power. He is in charge of his own life. A picture of the many false in that day who will say, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name and in your name cast out devils and in your name done many wonderful works? A picture of those to whom Jesus will say, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity, you lawless ones, you who are not submissive to God's power and authority. So what might be some things that all three of these have in common, the dragon known as the devil and the beast and with the seven heads and ten horns picturing the, the kingdoms and the nations of this world and the false prophet, or if you will, a false Christian, the, the false follower of the lamb, pictured as the beast with these two horns of a lamb here that we just read about. I believe they do what they do to exalt and promote themselves and they're not under God's established authority they all function with that same evil power and authority of the dragon, the devil. And uh, back in Revelation 16, we can flip back there, Revelation 16, verse 13, I submit to you that this verse confirms that they are all of the same evil nature. Revelation 16 and verse 13 says, I saw three unclean spirits, like frogs, come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. All three. The same kind of spirit in all three. And the very next verse, verse 14, would indicate that these spirits are from the devil and can literally do miracles. Verse 14, they are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth into the kings of the earth of the and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. And then in, in chapter 19 and 20, we see that all three of these, the beast and the dragon and the false prophet, end up in the same place together, that lake of fire and brimstone. So we can flip over there to uh, Revelation 19. It says, and, and uh, in verse verse 20 it says in Revelation 19 verse 20 it says the beast was taken prisoner along with him the false prophet who had performed the signs in his presence who deceived those who accepted the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image with these signs and both of them were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur and jumping on down in, in chapter 20 the second verse there it says he ceased the, the angel there ceased the dragon that ancient serpent called the devil and Satan, and he bound him for a thousand years. But then after the thousand years, over in verse 10, it says that the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So we briefly looked at who the beast and his co-workers are, if you will. 
and what they're like. They, they want to be in, con in charge or in and in control and are not submissive to God's established authority. Well, who am I like? Who am I following? Am I following the lamb, the humble lamb? Am I following the lamb with us wherever he goes? Or this evil, self-exalting, self-promoting beast? Unsubmissive to God's established authority. So what does it take to get the victory over him, over them, over this beast and his co-workers? In a nutshell, very simply put, I believe that uh, chapter 17, verse 14, if we flip over there again, verse 14, I believe, has the answer for us of what it takes to be victorious over this beast. If we follow the Lamb, whithersoever he goes, our victory is as sure as the victory of the Lamb, as uh, mentioned, as we see here in verse 14. These will make war, verse 14, chapter 17. These will make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them. Hallelujah. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. And that's us. And our part is to be faithful. And if we are faithful, our victory is as sure as the victory of the Lamb. If we are faithful and we stay with Him, our victory is as sure as the victory of the Lamb. So the key to victory over this evil beast and his comrades lies within the promised seed, if you will, the seed being Jesus, the Lamb of God, that seed that... Uh, we already see a picture of back there in Genesis 3. Uh, Genesis 3, where we see a picture of, I believe, victory over that serpent, that ancient serpent, that subtle beast, along with a picture of the cost of the victory. Genesis 3, verse 14, the Lord curses that, that uh, serpent called the devil because of what he had done. And then in verse 15, he says, uh, the Lord speaking here says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed, and that seed, being the capital S, Jesus, the Lamb of God, and he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. And so, do you see this picture of victory? The head of the serpent is under the heel of the seed of the woman, the seed being Jesus. And the head of that serpent is under uh, the position of victory over that serpent. And yet, at the same time, uh, there's a picture of the cost as the serpent bruises the heel of the seed. And Isaiah says, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Our iniquities, our rebellion, our going our own way. The chastisement of his peace, of our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep, and here's the rebellion, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've all turned to our own way, every one of us. And the Lord has laid upon him, upon the seed, upon Jesus, the Lamb of God, the iniquity of us all, the rebellion of us all. The Lord has laid it upon Jesus, and Jesus took our iniquity, our lawlessness, if you will, our rebellion against God upon himself so that we can be healed from this awful, sinful, straying nature that we were born with, this rebellious nature that is very much like that rebellious beast and that serpent that deceived Adam and Eve, who wants to be in charge or in control of his own life and refusing to be under God's established authority. <clears throat> Jesus, our healer, our deliverer, our savior, the Lamb of God who came to save his people from their sin and rebellion against God. He never rebelled once, always did the will of his Father, always, he said. He was tempted there in the wilderness and he had the opportunity to exalt himself and to be in control of the kingdoms of this world by simply falling down and worshiping the devil. And you know, it doesn't take that much to worship the devil. Just simply be like him by refusing to submit myself to God's established authority. 
be in charge and take control of my own life, and perhaps even with a Christian appearance to it, like the false prophet. It's still the same nature. But Jesus, <clears throat> the Lamb of God, did not give in to that rebellious, self-exalting beast that all of us have been infected with from birth, and he continued to walk that path of humility, that path of humility and obedience to his Father, and he humbled himself all the way to the death of the cross. And therefore, because of that, God, it says in Philippians, has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on the earth and those under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus, the Lamb of God, the way to the Father, the one who in essence said that if you want to follow me, you have to refuse to be in charge of your own life. You have to deny yourself and pick up the cross and follow me, as uh, Brother Paul shared so beautifully last Sunday in the message. We must love not our life unto the death if we want to overcome the nature of this beast. As it says there, uh, and we can flip there, back there, Revelation 12 again, um, Revelation 12, that very fam familiar verse, it says, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their life unto the death. And I, I believe we have a beautiful picture of victory over the beast here in chapter 11 of Revelation, where I submit to you that this is a picture of the true prophets, if you will, the true Christians, the true followers of the Lamb uh, here in, in, in chapter 11. The true followers of the Lamb who have the testimony of Jesus, as mentioned in the last verse of chapter 12, and who love not their lives unto the death, as mentioned in verse 11 of chapter 12. <clears throat> and this picture is quite unlike the, the picture of the false prophet, that false Christian, if you will, the false follower of the Lamb with the two horns that we saw there in, in chapter 13, who has an outward life-giving show of great wonders and miracles, but inwardly functions with the nature and the power of the beast, that dragon, that devil. So, what power are these witnesses here in chapter 11? What power are they functioning in that so enables them to overcome this beast that even though their physical bodies are slain, yet in the end they experience resurrection life? What power is in them that enables them to have such victory? I believe verse 11 here of, uh, of chapter 11 would indicate that it is the very spirit of life from God that is within them that resurrects them and gives them this life. And uh, the correlating passage of Scripture here back in Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 4, I believe would, would um, gives us a picture, a beautiful picture, I believe, of these these witnesses here. And Zechariah, Zechariah um, sees kind of what is described here in, in, in uh, verse 4 of chapter 11. Verse 4, chapter 11, there's two olive trees and there's two candlesticks standing before the God of the whole earth. And uh, that is kind of what Zechariah sees back there. He sees a picture of that. And he really wants to know, Zechariah, back in Zechariah 4, maybe we can just flip back there. Uh, Zechariah chapter 4, verse 11 through 14. Um, so, then answered I, and I said, 
what are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side thereof? And I answered again and said to him, what be these two olive branches which through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? And he answered me and said, knowest thou not what these be? And I said, no, my Lord. Then said I, these are the two anointed ones that stand before the Lord of the whole earth. So do you see the picture? The picture of being filled with the Holy Spirit and continually abiding. And Jesus said there in, uh, in, in Matthew, or in, in John 15, I am the vine, you are the branches. And he that abides in me, the same brings forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. You know, I feel like we get, we get so distracted with trying to figure out, maybe, if you will, who these two witnesses are, that we miss the main point, which I submit to you is not loving our life unto the death and being filled with the oil of the Spirit, the life of God, and continually abiding in the anointing of the Holy Spirit. See, these, these witnesses, um, just like these witnesses are filled with that life-giving Spirit of God, and they're lit when they open their mouth to speak. So we, the, uh, the vessel, or if you will, the lamp, our lamp must be continually filled with the oil of the Holy Spirit so that we can be lit and be prepared for when that cry goes out. Behold, the bridegroom, bridegroom comes, and the five wise virgins enter into the marriage. And so, in chapter 11, and we can flip back there to chapter 11 again, uh, Revelation chapter 11. In chapter 11 here, John, in the beginning of chapter 11, is told to rise and measure, take a measurement. And the question is, um, Who's going, to be, who's going to be in the presence of God, in the dwelling place of God? I, and I submit to you that this gives us, the, that John, what John measures here gives us the exact measurement and that these witnesses are, are uh, basically the measurement that John was instructed to take in verse 1. He's told to rise and measure the temple of God, or if you will, the dwelling place of God, and the altar and them that worship therein. And this chapter, chapter 11, is in the context of when that seventh trumpet sounds and the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. That's the context of this chapter. And the question is, who will be in the dwelling place of God when that last trumpet sounds and the dead in Christ rise? And this is what John is told to measure or to determine, if you will. And I believe these witnesses are a picture of that. Those who have overcome and been victorious over the beast by choosing not to love their life unto the death and by yielding themselves to the spirit of life from God and continually abiding in him, those are the ones that are going to be in and are going to have resurrection life in the end. And Romans 8, that beautiful verse, if the spirit of him who raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken or make alive your mortal body by his spirit that dwells in you. And that is, I believe, both now, in a small way, and then in the fullest way possible. Have you been born of the spirit of the living God? Has the spirit of life in Christ Jesus made you free from sin and death? Is he making you free? Are you in the process of being made free? Or are you getting more and more into bondage and slavery to sin? Are you following the Lamb with us wherever He goes and experiencing that victory now, which is only the down payment of the victory which is yet to come? Or have you simply settled for doing the expected Christian things that the culture around you says you should do while deep inside that beastly nature that we're all born with remains untouched and unchanged. It's very alive and functioning and doing well. 
That nature that says, I will be in charge and in control of my life. No one will tell me what to do. I will live the Christian life my way. And it's not working too well for you, is it? I've found it to not work very well. And I have experienced that. Actually, the same thing that was sort of, that I was up against, finding it hard to submit to my earthly authorities, that same nature, it's the same nature that needs to be dealt with if I want to truly um, overcome and be victorious in the Christian life over sin and this very nature of the enemy. So I invite you to come. Come and just humbly admit. All of us can just come and humbly admit this and confess this, this evil nature that we're born with, that every one of us, us is born with, this rebellious nature, and experience the true gospel, the true gospel, the power of God unto salvation. And if we do that, Praise the Lord. When that last trumpet sounds, all those who are victorious over this beast and over his, over his, uh, his nature will be in the temple of God, if you will, in the dwelling place of God, and are going to be able to inherit all things, everything. Revelation 21 and verse 7. We can flip back there. Revelation 21 verse 7. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. All these things that, uh, that the first six verses talk about in Revelation 21, all these things of the new heaven and the new earth that he just got done so beautifully describing for us, where God once again dwells with his people. And John was told to measure who's going to be in the dwelling place of God in the end when that last trumpet sounds. But on the other hand, this, this uh, next verse, I believe, would indicate that those who do not overcome will find themselves in that same place as the beast and the false prophet and the dragon, that ancient serpent called the devil. Verse 8, it says, The fearful and the unbelieving, the abominable, and the murderers and the sexually immoral the sorcerers and the idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Those who do not overcome will join the beast and his co-workers. So in closing, let's read about the beautiful inheritance of those who can actually overcome. And verse, verse uh, 1 through 6 here of, of chapter 7, of chapter 21. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice saying from heaven, Behold, the tabernacle, or if you will, the dwelling place of God is with men, and he will be with them, and he shall be, they shall be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying, and there shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. And he that sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of water of life freely to him who thirsts. And then it's verse 7 that we read earlier. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. He who overcomes shall inherit all things of the new heaven and the new earth. 
He who overcomes the nature of this evil beast, this evil self-exalting beast. He who follows the Lamb whithersoever he goes will be able to sing the song of victory, the song of Moses and the song of Lamb, of the Lamb. He who loves not his life unto the death, he who denies himself and picks up his cross and follows the Lamb whithersoever he goes will be able to experience this inheritance while the beast and the false prophet and the dragon and all their followers will be tormented in the lake of fire and brimstone day and night forever. We get to enjoy the new heaven and the new earth, our full inheritance with God forever. Amen. God bless you.